Okay, a very warm welcome everyone on this lovely sunny evening. I hope it's sunny where you are, it's here in, in Edinburgh. Um, I'm Fiona Richmond uh, and I'm uh, just a so newly appointed uh, guest president of Ladam London. Um, and we're really thrilled to have you all here tonight. Um, and we're definitely amongst friends. Um, so many of you know each other already. So, but a very warm welcome to anyone who hasn't been uh, with us before. Um, we're really thrilled to welcome um, Darina Allen to this really, really special evening. Um, Darina needs no introduction, um, but we'll plenty of time to, to hear her stories uh, shortly. Um, but before we start, um, for those of you who are not so familiar with what we do at Les Dam, um, we're an international network of, of leading women in the food, drink and hospitality sectors. And I noticed that we've got some of our dames from the US here tonight, which is uh, fantastic. Thank you for joining us. And very international audience. We've got um, guests from Copenhagen, uh, Vancouver, um, all over the world, which is really fantastic. We have members um, reaching sort of over two and a half thousand. Um, in London, we have a, a small chapter of about 35. Um, we're always looking for new um, women to join us and to help us in our work. Essentially, what we do is um, support other women through our philanthropic activity, through mentoring others, educating, inspiring, and just being a really strong network of women in the field and helping to, to support one each, uh, each other and, uh, and lift each other up. So we're really um, pleased, as I say, to have the second in our series of Desert Island Dishes events. Uh, we welcomed Prue Leith last time, and um, I'm sure many of you um, already know and love the work of Darina and anyone who's been to Ballymaloo will, will know what a very special kind of magic that it holds. It's, it's very hard to sum that up, but it's a feeling you get that never ever leaves you. Um, so we're very much looking forward to Darina to hearing from you um, just shortly. Um, but before we do that, um, for every event that we run, we like to partner with a like-minded organisation and help raise awareness of their work and raise funds. And, and tonight we're really thrilled to be a part with um, the Sustainable Food Trust um, and delighted to welcome Adele Jones who's the Deputy CEO and I'm just going to invite you Adele now just to say a few words about what you do and how uh, we can all support you. Thank you very much Fiona and, and thank you all for uh, allowing us to partner with you on this what sounds like a fantastic event this evening. So good good evening to you all or good afternoon or, or morning to those in the US. Um, my name is Adele Jones. I'm Deputy Chief Executive of the Sustainable Food Trust. Um, I, I recognize some of the names um, in the participant list. So some of you may be aware of our work, but for those uh, who are new, um, we are a small UK based charity, but we also have an international focus and broadly we help accelerate the transition towards more sustainable food and farming systems. And we do that by working in a mixture of ways, both bottom up. So we work very closely with farmers in the UK, but farmers all over the world um, to, to understand what is currently preventing them from, from making a transition towards more sustainable farming systems? Is it economics? Is it the marketplace? Uh, so we, we work closely with farmers to help them make that transition and understand what it is that they need to, to start making those changes to become part of the climate change and nat nature solution. We also work um, in the middle, so say, so with all the other organisations uh, in collaboration who are also working in this space. It's an incredibly active and inspiring movement at the moment. It really feels like we're starting to make some progress in this sustainability, in this sustainability world. Um, and we also work you know, at, at the very top, I suppose. So influencing policymakers, business leaders, uh, those in, in very you know, influential positions of leadership uh, to understand how, how they can start introducing incentives and disincentives to start really helping that shift that we all need to see now with our food and farming systems. So we, uh, we had a slightly bizarre weekend a couple of weeks ago where we were asked to write various briefings for the G7 leaders, including Joe Biden and the Prince of Wales and, uh, and President Macron. So uh, if, if, though, if they are all interested in, in sustainable farming, then hurrah, <laughs> we must be getting somewhere, um, but still, still a lot of work to do. So um, it's, uh, it, it's certainly an exciting time and things are moving very rapidly, but there's also a need to make sure that any changes that are made are, are done so in an authentic way. 
Um, so I, I mentioned barriers to change. Um, I thought I'd just very briefly touch on a couple of those. Um, and I also mentioned the, the fact that economics is often a, a really big barrier for farmers who are wanting to be more sustainable. So one of our big work areas is something we call true cost accounting in food and farming, which is basically looking at the hidden costs of agriculture to the environment or public health that are not currently accounted for in the price of food. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean to say that we think food should be more expensive, but we do think the worst food should be more expensive. So the food that's causing damage to our environment, nature, climate change, as well as public health, and therefore allowing for that sustainable alternative to become effectively the no-brainer food for farmers to grow, but also consumers to, and citizens to purchase. Um, so we do a lot of work on, on true cost accounting and how we, how we measure that impact on the ground. We also do quite a lot of work on disseminating what it means to have a healthy and sustainable diet. Uh, and I, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir somewhat here with this audience, um, but it's obviously the question on everyone's lips right now. What should, what, what should we eat to be part of the climate change and nature solution? And I think it's uh, a really interesting discussion uh, and debate to have. Um, and of course, there's no silver bullet answer. Uh, it is complex. The food system is inherently complex. Farming is uh, interwoven with so many different dynamic systems uh, and interdependencies with the land. And therefore, you know, it's, it's, it's not right to say that this is, the, this is the right answer or that is the right answer. It's actually a very nuanced argument. But uh, we do a lot of work uh, looking at the benefits of grazing livestock and making sure we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater when we think about intensive um, livestock production, which we absolutely think is not part of the future. Um, but we do see that grazing livestock um, and sustainable meat produced in that, in that way uh, is, is you know, very much part of the solution, at least in grass-based nations such as this. We're actually a, a nation two-thirds grass. It's our most productive crop. So if we can utilize that to create healthy and nutritious food, which is part of the climate change solution, it's a win-win from our perspective. And finally, I just wanted to touch on our work, uh, which we refer to as harmony in food and farming. And this is a, this is a concept that was um, coined by the Prince of Wales, who is our patron. And he um, has been exploring the principles of harmony, as he refers to them as. Uh, so things like uh, nature's cycles, uh, interconnectedness, um, and all these things that happened around us in nature, which actually we should be trying to replicate in our everyday lives and the way we produce food and eat food, cook food. Um, and so what we're trying to do is understand how the principles of harmony can be applied on the ground on farms and in the way we um, produce and, and, and eat our food, but also in the way that school children are taught. Um, so we're working with a very inspiring man called Richard Dunn to understand how the principles of harmony can be integrated into the current school curricula to, to help create the, the, the next generation of leaders um, who can be you know, the ones that guide us into this, into this climate change and uh, nature uh, set of solutions that we need to now see. Um, so I just wanted to, to say finally, um, thank you. Thank you for this wonderful evening. Thank you, Darina, for nominating us as your partner this evening. We really are truly honoured. Um, our director, Patrick Holden, who, um, who some of you may know, uh, says hello. He's at a conference in Switzerland this week, uh, but he was really, really de de delighted to hear about this opportunity as well. Um, so, so thank you all and really looking forward to hearing the discussion. Thank you very much, Adele. Um, some you know, hugely important work that you've got on your plate. So thank you for sharing that with us uh, tonight. Um, okay, Anne, over to you. I'd just like to welcome Anne Dollimore, our Vice President and uh, Founder of Grub Street Publishing. Um, so over to you. Thank you very much. And we'll keep any questions to the end. Just put them in the chat. Probably, probably a little bit later on will be better. And then we'll pick them up and put them to Dina uh, later in the evening. So thank you. Thanks, Fiona. Um, hello. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you, Fiona, and thank you, um, Adele. Um, I'm sure that Darina and I will be revisiting um, later on this evening the question of sustainability, because I know it's something very close to Darina's heart. Um, obviously, um, as we said, we're thrilled to have Darina joining us. Um, 
and we should have been seeing her in person last year when Les Dames um, in London arranged their biannual trip overseas for our American um, partners and members. And we had arranged this fantastic uh, edible island with um, trip to Galway and then on to the Burren and Darina was going to um, join us to be our guest of honor at, at, at a wonderful dinner, but it wasn't to be, but we hope we can um, do it um, sometime further down the line. But in place of that, we obviously have Darina here virtually tonight from Cork. Um, what's the weather like over there at the moment, Darina? Well, actually it's just started to rain, surprise, surprise. <laughs> So I know you probably won't believe me, but it was. <laughs> well, the, the, the fact is, I, I know that you don't really need very much in the way of, um, of introduction because um, so many of our participants this evening, of which we have many, as you know, from all over, which is really exciting, will know you. But just for anybody who perhaps isn't aware of your incredibly august and important um, career, um, you, you know, founder of Ballymaloe, famed th throughout the world um, as one of the sort of forefront cookery schools, which you set up in the 1980s. Uh, you are a, a multiple published cookbook author, 19 books, I think I, I have on my calculation. And um, eight series of your super successful um, um, television series, Simply Delicious, which I don't know whether many people would have seen it, but but some will maybe have been able to catch up with it on streaming and downline these days. For, for people who don't know, um, Ballymolo is in fact, and this is why I think it's going to be very pertinent later on to have discussion about sustainability, which uh, Adele, and which is obviously why it's your chosen charity, um, Darina, because you're a hundred acre organic farm um, and obviously that feeds into everything that you do and, and, and was basically where you came from in the beginning but what I'd like to do um, just to quote Julie Andrews from The Sound of Music is start at the very beginning <laughs> so if I can, can scroll you back to your I'd like to start I'd like to work through your childhood your your influences and then what I'd like to do is to drop in along the way the desert island dishes that you um you you chose and I will drop those in and ask you to expand on those and then we can finish off with your your luxury item which I best most people won't guess what it is you know it, it's not a double bed with a duvet or anything but anyway so so Darina take us back to um Mary Darina O'Connell uh, and her childhood and her family and a wonderful <laughs> typical Irish family um so was food something that figured back then or was Irish food still so back in the dark ages <laughs> Uh, well, actually, Mommy loved to cook. She absolutely loved to cook. And I'm the eldest of nine children. So there was, you know, cooking going on all the time in our kitchen. By the time you'd finished from one meal, it was time to almost start for the next meal. So uh, basically, I was really, and we also had, and my child, we had, a, Mommy loved to garden as well as cook. So we had a kitchen garden with a house cow, a Kerry cow, a wicked one with horns and everything. And uh, of course, some hens and everything and uh, eggs. So that was my childhood. It was totally my norm. And uh, so I learned um, uh, one of my first dishes, which if I can mention, mention it before you do, was I chose uh, soda bread and, and butter, basically. And really, in a way, this reminds me uh, so much of mummy, because every day we went to school in the little village school down at the end of the hill. And uh, every time we came up from school, running up from school up the hill, you know, we you'd smell as you came in the smell of the fresh bed, bed baking. She made soda bread every single day. Uh, and then scones, there'd be a tray of scones coming out of the oven or something, and we'd have those when we came home from school. So I never remember learning how to make bread. I just sort of uh, absorbed it by osmosis almost. I remember, uh, I think I remember, maybe it was, uh, it was prompted by a photograph, literally almost being just tall enough to see over the table, and mummy giving me, uh, I, I wanted to help, of course, and mummy giving me a little bit of the dough, and then I made it into a little round, and patted it, of course, and it would have been as hard as a rock, but anyway. And uh, then uh, cutting the, the cross in it. In Ireland, uh, traditional soda bread will have 
you, you do the traditional blessing by marking it with the, the sign of the cross. And that actually has practical reason because it opens in the center so the heat can uh, penetrate into the center where it's the last place it cooks. So anyway, I would cut it with a little cross and, and then she would put my little kishteen, as we called it in Ireland, it means a little cake, in beside her bread into the essay. It was sort of a naga type stove and out it would come and of course because of being overhandled it would be as hard as a rock but everybody would say it was delicious <laughs> so I learned how to make bread and uh, you know without ever being sort of thought in a way and then as we know of course that's the way the skills were passed on at that time and then butter has always been well butter is so important in Ireland anyway as you know and uh, somebody was referring earlier there to, to the grass uh, Adele was referring to Britain. I was interested that you're two thirds grass. I wonder what the proportion is in Ireland or the percentage. But uh, we grow grass like nowhere else in the world, pretty much in Ireland here. So a lot of our best foods come from our grass, including our dairy products. And so uh, the I was taught how to make butter. I just caught the end of an era, actually. In the uh, 1950s, I would have been uh, in, in the summer, instead of being going on holidays to Lanzarote or wherever people go nowadays, I was sent up to to, for, to spend a week or fortnight with my relatives in the bog in County Tipperary. And I learned how to cut turf. And, and also my great aunt Lil, who used to cook over the open fire, by the way, cook soda bread in a bastable over the open fire. So I also learned the skill of cooking like that. But also she made butter every couple of days. And I showed me how to do the little butter pats. And that was rich yellow butter, you know, summer butter when the cows were out on the grass and all of that. So bread and butter, if I could only choose two foods, I think bread and good butter. Now, of course, we have a little tiny Jersey herd at the on our farm, the cooking school. So we make butter literally. Every, we teach the students actually how to make butter every day. So that's a really important it was a very important part of my childhood, and uh, it's uh, uh, one of my happiest memories, this bread. I can still smell the bread coming out of the oven. And it, it's interesting, isn't it, Darina, because obviously soda bread, I mean, is an absolutely iconic part of Irish yeah. cuisine and eating. And is it because of its very nature, because it just rises through baking powder and things, do you think it was because it came from an essentially peasant stock if I can put it like that that didn't need yeast that could be whipped up in a matter of moments and as you said I mean uh, my mother came from Ireland I grew up going back to the family farm where everything was cooked in a bastable and so it was very simple and could be knocked up in in no time at all yeah it's totally that Anne because first and foremost in Ireland the peach we grow uh, is a, a low gluten wheat, a soft wheat not suitable for making yeast bread uh, so most people would have had a cow or would have had access to a cow at a time before refrigeration, uh, basically. So when the milk was left out over a day or two, uh, the milk would coagulate and become sour. So now you have you have soft flour and and you have uh, um, and you have a, a, a buttermilk. Oh yes, and people made butter, and of course the, uh, the 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 liquid from the leftover from the butter was called buttermilk, and that or with sour milk. Then bicarbonate of soda was, uh, was uh, introduced at the end of the 18th century, as far as I remember, 18 something. And then you had, so it's so simple to make as well. You don't need any special equipment. You just put the flour into a bowl, add in uh, some salt, uh, some bicarbonate of soda, and that's of course an alkali, and that would react with the acid in the sour milk to create little bubbles of carbon dioxide. And then they were trapped in the heat of the bastard or the heat of the oven, and hey presto, you had bread in 30, 35 minutes. If I could only teach people one thing, it would be <laughs> how to make a soda bread, how to make a loaf of bread. Because, you know, I remember a number of years ago when we had this big snowstorm in Ireland and a similar thing happened with COVID actually, when suddenly people, you know, the, some of the shelves in the supermarket were empty and there were people, you know, in, you know, during the snowstorm, there were people in these fur coats and all the rest of it all dolled up and they were practically pulling loaves of, squishy sliced pan from each other and a couple of shelves further over there was flour and buttermilk and people have we've lost the skill but there's still many people still make a soda bread in Ireland it's such a simple bread to make and uh, you know everybody should be able to make a little loaf of bread and it doesn't matter what else you make you know if you have friends around to supper and you produce your own bread and butter how about that you know people are mightily impressed and uh, it only takes a couple of minutes to make it's the way to everybody's heart 
Uh, I often joke, we'll never get anything, if we don't get off bread, we'll never have anything else said, but I always joke with the students when they come to the school that if they want to bring on a proposal, what they should do is ask their intended round to supper and then just time it. So when you're opening the door, uh, you know, the smell of freshly baked bread just wafts out towards them and you're home and dry. <laughs> the proposal will be that evening. What are we like? Where did I get onto this subject? <laughs> Sorry, Anne, you'll have to keep me on track. No, 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 this, this is fine. It, 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 it makes me think a bit because of, obviously it, it, it isn't a bread that lasts terribly well, is it? So this would be why people bake it. And I, I was just suddenly thinking when you were saying how much like the French with, with, with having bread every single day. Yes, yes, it's very much best on the day that it's made, but it does toast well too. Uh, it's, it's good. And then if there's some leftover, you can make a soda bread and butter pudding. Lots of fat raisins and so it's that delicious. Sounds, that sounds fabulous. I've never, I've never, I've never thought of, of, of doing that. Let's scroll on a bit, um, Darina. So childhood going to relatives making butter um you you said though the family had um that you had your own cow did you say that you had when you, you your we family did you make butter there uh, as well uh, no we didn't make butter we just had the cow for milk because mommy was a carry cow really good quality milk uh, and uh, you know mommy uh, and of course, we all drank raw milk because mommy really knew the value of raw milk for our health and all of that. Uh, so we had uh, our own cow uh, that, so that we had really, really good milk. And uh, then, of course, vegetables in the garden and all of that. When I look back now, how fortunate was I? And as well as that, we, I went to the little village school, as I mentioned, a very good little national school in Ireland. And mommy had arranged, it was years later that this penny dropped. Mommy had arranged because we were so close to the school for us to run home at lunchtime for our lunch. So every day we ran up the hill uh, and mommy would have a lovely bubbly stew or something uh, for us to eat. And then we'd, uh, often we resented the length of time it took us for us to eat it. We'd gobble it down, and then run back down to play with our friends. But now I realise how fortunate I was foundation of you know I've been for, you know fortunate to have had that foundation of health from instead of having you know a, a sort of little a little sandwich or something that one many of my friends might have had and mommy realized mommy always knew the importance of putting the effort onto the food in, on the table and I remember she used to say if you don't put the effort into the food on the table you give it to the doctor or the chemist and <laughs> you know and you know she knew that our food should be our medicine and you know now of course we know the less one spends on nutritious food the more one spends on meds and so on so uh, you know there were lots of I wish I could remember all her her sayings and you know uh, my father died when I was 14 so mommy had was left with nine children uh, when my father died my younger sister was posthumous she was born a month after my father died and she was just 36 my goodness, I, I thought she must know everything at that stage, you know, wise and everything. My goodness, when I was suddenly 36 and with just a couple of children, I suddenly the penny dropped how extraordinary and how terrified she must have been and how extraordinary it was. And, you know, they adored each other, uh, which was another... Anyway, look again. I'm going off on a tangent, but no, no, no. This is this is wonderful, <laughs> really, because I, I, I'm I'm coming to the next thing, and I think you you you've in a way sort of um, explained it because, of course, um, you know, I I published Marguerite Patton, and Marguerite um had a working mother and and stepped up to the to the mark to cook when her mother was working. So I'm I'm thinking here that did your um, eventual move into wanting to go into food come from having to rally round your mother with, with, with all the children to look after and helping out? Well, funny, uh, quite a few of us are involved with food, actually, but uh, not, not the entire family. Uh, some of them are accountants and uh, all kinds of other things, but we all, every one of us cook in a way, uh, like, like me, we all learned the basics at home. And of course, I can tell you with nine of us, there was a big list up on the wall saying the job. <laughs> <laughs> and you did, there were jobs you did before you went to school, jobs you did when you came home after cl class and everything. And we just took that as a, you know, we just took that for granted. And, uh, uh, and you know, honestly, I feel so fortunate for that too, because I think in a way it taught me, it, it gave me a work ethic, not to speak of the, of, of the actual uh, example of my mother, but it gave me a work ethic. Because now when I see so many youngsters, I feel really sorry for them when they just have, really have no idea how to go about doing 
anything. And we, we do them a big disservice when we don't actually show them how to work and the value of work and the joy of work uh, in so many ways and the satisfaction well, of you, you come from a, a long line. We, we'll, we'll move on a bit later on, but obviously an, a, an amazing line of matriarchs, not only from your mother, but from Myrtle, who we'll move on to a bit later. So, so let me move you on now to your decision to go to catering college, but that was less to do with you wanting to cook and more with you wanting to manage, yes? Oh, no. <laughs> you know, I... Well, Anne, I had no ambition. You know, when I, I was sent to boarding school because, you know, but, and I was educated by the lovely Dominican nuns in Wicklow, actually, in Ireland, because uh, that was a very good school and there was not a school like it close to us. So anyway, the Dominican nuns were very visionary nuns. And uh, at that time, in the early 60s, they were very much encouraging us girls, it was just girls, to have a proper career, you know, to do medicine, do the sciences, do law, do... Uh, architecture or something and uh, so it was coming to the end of, of and where I had to make a decision and I really didn't know anything about any of that actually the only thing I knew anything about from my background as you can tell by now was actually cooking or gardening or so basically I decided I wanted to either be a cook or I uh, or else I wanted to be a gardener now at first I was the nuns were you know well yeah, um, you know, and lovely. This is not doing. They were saying, "Well, you're never going to need that, my dear. You know, you'll have some <laughs> cook. You're going to be a career woman, and you will never. You know, you won't need. Uh, 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 you'll have somebody to cook for you, or whatever. I mean, they were wonderful nuns, but and they were obviously encouraging us. Anyway, I persisted, and so then they said, "Well, okay. Um, you know, either it's a degree in horticulture or uh, hotel management." And I basically, you see, the thing is, and you may remember when cooks and chefs said absolutely no starters you know you never heard the name of the cook or a chef you know men were chefs women uh, kept out of mischief or whatever so anyway okay I applied for hotel management in Carl Bruce Street in Dublin which is now DIT didn't even get in on the first uh, uh, try actually because um, I <laughs> this was terrible but a part of the entrance exam was they gave us an IQ test and I had never seen an IQ test before uh, and I, I couldn't work out how to put all those little diamond triangles, <laughs> and circles into boxes. And I, I you know, I, I know now there's a knack of doing it. But anyway, at that stage, I was mesmerized, failed miserably. Fortunately, somebody fell out and I got in. And, you know, when I left, when I was at school, boys school, I really had no ambition at all, actually, really. I just wanted to pass the time until I found a nice chap really preferably somebody who'd have a bit of money and then I'd have a few cute little kids and that would be it that was the extent of my ambition so you can tell the nuns had a bit of a problem but anyway off I went and then at the end of the this uh, uh, you know my management course same problem I, I still wanted to cook I, I really and I used to mitch some of the other classes and go off and play poker but I never missed a cooking class and <laughs> now I to get into one of the top four or five good restaurants in Dublin you know just they didn't have women in the kitchen and so it was very close to the end of the course and you never know in your life what's the tiny thing that can change the course of the rest of your life actually and it was one day in the corridor one of the senior lecturers came up to me in despair and said have you not got a job yet everybody else seems to have a job and you know from that course uh, there were only about 30 in the class actually and uh, you would have the job you would have aspired to was assistant manager uh, in uh, one of the top hotels in Dublin, the Russell or, or you know, Shelburne or something. And you'd have a lovely little uniform and you'd have a badge saying you're assistant manager. And I thought, I secretly thought I was another word for slave. And <laughs> I'm just not interested. And I told her, and she said to me, what do you want? And I said, I want to learn. I want to cook more. I want to learn more about fresh herbs. I want to make oh, wait, ice cream. I want to learn how to... For some reason, I had a fixation about learning how to smoke fish or something. <laughs> and so she, she said to me, funny, she said, I was at a dinner party the other night with some friends and they were talking about this woman down in Cork, this extraordinary woman who has opened a restaurant uh, in a farm out in, out in the country. And she writes the menu every day. Now, this is at a time, by the way, when, when restaurants opened and the chef wrote the menu, it was said 10 years later. The idea of writing the menu every day 
was, you know, this was all, by the way, in incredulous tones, you know, uh, she told me. And But she said they have a Jersey herd and they make their own ice cream and they have their own pigs and it's in the middle of a farm and they grow mushrooms and they're close to the sea. And, and she doesn't like the menu until the fish comes in from the boats in, in this little fishing village called Valley Cotton, which is near them. And, and I said, oh, my goodness. I couldn't believe my ears. It was like it was ticking all the boxes. And I said, oh, my, that's, you know, I love that. She couldn't remember her name. Uh, so she said, I'll, I'll go back to my friends. And she came back a few days later. She had a little piece of paper. She said, that's the name of the woman. Write to her and see, can you get a job? And I wrote to her and this lovely letter, which I had for years. And somehow or other, I must have had a fit of tidying, lost it. But I said, the, uh, wrote Mart the, the name of the woman was Myrtle Allen. Myrtle Allen. Myrtle Allen, who became my mother-in-law by the simple expedient of marrying her eldest son. But this lovely letter saying, I have, we'd love to have you. I have children your age. And little did she know. <laughs> so, so, anyway, so Davina, you, 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 went to, to, you went to Ballymelow, which of course was the restaurant and the hotel, um, yes. and, and worked for Myrtle. Um, and that must have been a real revelation because it must have been everything you thought that you wanted to do. And Myrtle, let's briefly, I, I mean, I, this is about you, but obviously you wouldn't oh. be where you are if it had. I mean, Myrtle was the trailblazer. I mean, thinking yes. back to, to what yes. she started back then is just yes. beyond amazing. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah. Total pioneer without ever realizing that she was a total revolutionary. I mean, she just served the food of the farm and gardens. You know, all of this, all of those kind of cliches now about farm to fork, cooking from scratch, all of that, zero waste. I mean, it all applied. So how... No, Doreen, I'm just, I'm just going to stop you there for a second and, and see if one of your other desert island dishes fits in here. And that's your carrageenan moss pudding. Does that figure somewhere? <laughs> oh, it certainly does. Uh, carrageenan, for those, some of you indeed who are looking, you will know what carrageenan is. It's a little tiny seaweed which grows around the coasts of the island of Ireland and it grows carrageenan means little rock in the Gaelic and actually it grows on the little rocks and you harvest it after a spring tide when the tides are furthest out and uh, it, it actually of course these these seaweeds and we have about 650 around the coast of Ireland uh, it's a natural gelatin so uh, Myrtle we uh, so I had really not come across carrageenan until I came to family and Myrtle taught us how to harvest the carrageenan. We'd bring it back and make this delicious carrageenan moss pudding, a little bit like junket, actually, in the same sort of texture. And uh, so every time, and it's incredibly good for you. It's got iodine, with lots of trace elements in it, very mild and gentle. And uh, we still serve it on the sweet trolley because there's a sweet trolley at Valley Malou uh, every single night with Jersey cream, pouring cream and soft brown sugar. So that's definitely one of my desert island uh, dishes. And again, it's very important for me because it's part of our traditional food culture in Ireland. And this is something that I pass on to all the students uh, when they come uh, to the cooking school, teach them how to make this and encourage them to uh, put it onto their menus. And also, we also flavor it sometimes with uh, as a sweet geranium oil, which is the Pelagonium graviolus, that lovely uh, scented geranium that has this haunting lemony flavor. So it's a wonderful food, part of our food culture, enormously nutritious and super delicious. And it reminds me of Myrtle every time because of you know going down onto the beach and her teaching is all clustered around her, uh, uh, learning from her. Now, so not only was, was, was she at the forefront of, of obviously, as we said, um, you know, um, uh, plot to plate cooking. But, yeah. but but if she was doing that then, so was she also kind of at the forefront of foraging? Because um, I know that's something else you teach at, at, at Ballymelow and, and is a very important, and, and it is in any coastal um, yeah. uh, area. Well, I came to Ballymelow in 1968-69. And I remember, um, you know, uh, children coming to the kitchen door, they'd knock at the kitchen door and say, Miss, is Miss Allen there, Miss Allen there? And, you know, they'd have little tin cans. I don't know whether you remember when little uh, boiled sweets used to come in tin cans. And they'd have tin cans full of blackberries, wild blueberries, wild mushrooms, depending on the time of the year, uh, hazelnuts. Um, and they would say they would bring them and then uh, Myrtle would put them 
onto the, uh, she'd incorporate them into the menu and then she'd give them some pocket money, uh, which was, you know, so that was, of course, foraging before even the word, we even used the word foraging. Again, that kind of thing was part of my childhood, just throughout the year, you just, you know, collected whatever wild foods came in, dams and slows, all of that as well. So uh, at this stage, again, I'm absolutely a foraging nerd. Uh, I, you know, love taking the students out around the farm and gardens into the woods to, and, and down onto the seashore to show them to pass on that skill as well, which for many well, people... Let, let, let me drop in your next, um, as I said, we'll, we'll move to the setting up of the cookery school in a moment, but I can see a kind of, you know, connection here, because one of the other things you told me about was your love of sea urchins and razor clams. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, well, as sea urchins, we don't have right around us in Shanagari. Uh, I go up to Anishman and prize them out of the rock with the chisel there with the lovely de Blackham family. But actually, razor clams, we do have on the strand in Shanagari. The beach is only, you know, about five minutes uh, from the cooking school. And this, again, is after the spring tides. We, I, now I go down with my grandchildren and some of the the students and uh, we've got 11 grandchildren they all live within five minutes of us can you imagine but anyway and so we we go down armed with uh, little cartons of salt where you look on the on the on the sand and if you see a little hole uh, then it's a particular shape hole and then you pour a little salt into that and then the razor clam comes popping up uh, it's the most exciting thing and it's all right for the little ones because they can get down on their knees you see and be ready to catch it when it comes up. But now it's getting more and more difficult for me at 72 to, to go, uh, go down on my knees and get back up again quickly. But it's fantastic. And I we adore razor clams. Uh, and uh, again, obviously we got other clams, the ordinary clams and cockles and mussels and so on. And again, um, you know, we're fortunate in Ireland that our seas are still overall pretty clean. And so we can uh, just bring them up and, and eat them and share them and it's wonderful. So, Darina, uh, after years of working uh, alongside Myrtle and obviously marrying Tim, you, where did the idea for, and, and you opened the school with your brother, Rory, um, yes. what, where, where did the idea come from moving on from, from, from that and, and going and doing your own thing at the cookery school? Well, you know, the funny thing is, uh, Tim is a horticulturalist. Uh, we had, uh, at that stage in the early still in the, where am I now? We started school in the 80s. And yes, into the, up to the mid 80s, we had five, eight, we, my father-in-law again was a very progressive farmer and horticulturist, Ivan Allen. And so we had five, he had the first greenhouse in Ireland, five acres of greenhouse, big mushroom farm, 65 acres of apples um, and, um, you know, greenhouses and all the rest of it. Anyway, uh, so Tim had done horticulture, he was a horticulturist. So anyway, fast forward um, to the, um, I suppose the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, the the, the cook, Ballymanu Cooking School was born out of desperation. <laughs> and I took that lightly, it really was, because what happened in the late 70s, early 80s was there was a major recession in Ireland again. And basically there was 25% inflation. We And the oil crisis, we were heating the five acres of very old greenhouses that we really needed an investment, which we didn't have the money for at that time, um, with, uh, with oil. Uh, we had gone into the EU and in 1973, I think, and then the uh, uh, the cheap, cheap food policy kicked in. Or when we went into the EU, the big tidal wave of regulations came in, uh, you know, about a lot of the time totally out of proportion. But anyway, uh, basically uh, for our grading and all kinds of things. Now, we were exporting. We were not a Mickey Mouse operation. But anyway, the most serious thing, and then the supermarkets came on stream. And so then the whole cheap food policy kicked in. So instead of getting more for our produce, our beautiful produce, tomatoes, cucumbers, all those things, uh, every uh, year we, we were, and every month, we were seem to be getting less and less. And uh, so somebody, and it didn't look as though this was going to change. So somebody said, forget about the wholesalers. We had been, we're dealing with wholesalers, go on to the supermarkets. You know, they're the people to be involved with now. They're the future. So anyway, we were thrilled we got a, uh, we got a, a, a contract to supply Irish apples to one of the big Irish supermarket chains, which is still in business, because they were getting a lot of criticism that they had no Irish apples on. And anyway, we, you know, got graded them perfectly, got them in, and then made a contract, of course, and, and all of that. 
Uh, and then somehow or other, it seemed to happen that regularly some would be sent back or there'd be some reason why you couldn't be paid what you were had agreed to. And anyway, this went on for a while. And after a bit, we realized this was not a coincidence. This happened far too often. So at, at my, we used to have a lovely moment every day where I'd get the kids off to school. We have four children. And uh, the, the Tim would go into Cork early uh, to deliver the, the produce into the supermarket. And uh, then we'd, he'd arrive back, the children would gone to school, we'd sit down, we'd have breakfast together. And I remember one day he came to the kitchen door and he looked even more despondent than ever. And after some young pop of a supermarket buyer had sort of said, you know, take that back or there's a bruise here or there's something like that. And he said, I don't care if I have to crawl on my knees. I am never doing that again. We have to find a different way to earn a living. So as a young married couple with no money, basically, and uh, at that stage, we had to see what on earth other, what talents we had, what resources we had between us, and to see could we earn a living in a different way. And I could cook a bit. We had some outbuildings and we converted them, borrowed money and converted it into, into a little cooking school. And Ballymaloo, by the way, was already well established. Ballymaloo House by my mother and my father in law developed a reputation of you know, people really trusted and, and loved. Uh, so we were able to, you know, the name Ballymaloo was known. And my parents in law, when we decided they were desperate for us to actually find some way to earn a living, proper living. And obviously, it was, you know, it was obvious that the price of food was not going to go up again. It was just going to come down and down and down to the point where it was totally unsustainable and nothing much has changed, unfortunately, since. And it's become more and more difficult. But anyway, so to cut a long story short, we decided that I, I decided perhaps I could give some cooking classes because lots of my friends, you know, used to say to me occasionally when we'd have a little simple few friends, a simple dinner party, people say, how did you do that? And I'd say, it's really easy. You just do this and this and this. And but I suddenly the penny dropped that what seemed to be easy for me was not necessarily obvious to some of my friends. So I thought maybe I can teach people how to cook. We desperately needed it to work. And there's nothing like desperation, I can tell you, to make a business work. And then within well, two years, students well, like, first... like like Topsy, you you you've obviously grown and grown over the years, Darina, that now that you have you know the... still small, yeah international yeah. reputation and obviously yeah. as a result of, uh, of of that you've traveled all over the world and one of the other dishes that you gave me which uh, when you gave it to me I have to confess I had never heard of so I want to have a go at pronouncing this and it's probably all wrong but you will correct me is Kunan Aman is that is that right have oh, I said that Kunaman. Kunaman. a wonderful flaky buttery sweet syrupy uh, bread and pastries. Well, gosh, I, I, I sent you a whole list of things. I wasn't sure what you're going to pick out. Actually, this, uh, uh, the, the, you know, many people make these. You must look out for the manna because they're super delicious. Uh, uh, so basically, uh, the, the, where I've tasted the best one of these is in a little tiny sort of sort of stand up cafe down in down near the, in the village of New York, down off, down off, off East 19th Street. Uh, and it's called Daily Provisions, and they make these gorgeous, flaky, buttery kunaman uh, that are the funny expression that people use to die for. Uh, so, and I'm always longing, I cannot reproduce them as deliciously as they are, even though we have a bread shed where we do all kinds of lovely breads and things, but uh, divine, the kunaman, look out for them. I, I will look those up. Another favorite place of yours I know that you love is Mexico. Do you yes. want to tell us about your your Mexican mints? Your another of your dishes. <laughs> oh, I thought that must have been a bit of a disappointment when I said mints and rice. Uh, well, look, this brings back. Uh, I, you know, again, I've I've been very fortunate to travel a lot, and so there's always been a raison d'être to travelling for the school. To you know, if I do a trip and I come back with one or two ideas and recipes, I feel it's really worth the trip. Anyway, we love Mexico and India, so on. And on this particular trip. We were we loved to go and visit the Mayan ruins. So we had literally gone up the Isamacinta River uh, in a dugout canoe on and on for hours uh, up along to go and see these Mayan ruins deep in the jungle, uh, Yashilan, these particular ones. I'm sure that's not exactly how you pronounce it in, uh, in Spanish, but anyway, and uh, we were hot and it was humid and 
we went in to see these ruins. It was so beautiful, the howler monkeys and the birds. And we had to, had to have elastic bands on the end of our trousers so the snakes wouldn't play, climb off our legs. <laughs> God, I'm painting such a picture. But anyway, so we arrived back. It was sort of well over an hour into the, I think even almost two hours into the jungle, back again then. And in the boat, when we were coming up the dig out canoe, it looked a bit odd, but there were these great big cold boxes uh, you know, uh, in the dugout canoe. And when we came back to this little shack close to the river's edge, this woman had lit her uh, uh, in wonderful traditional clothes, which were her everyday clothes. She'd made a fire in the ground and she had cooked mince and rice, rice and mince, and uh, just with lots of cumin and salt. And then at the also they had, uh, obviously the ingredients had come up in these cold boxes and they had ice cold, Coca-Cola. Now I'm <laughs> I'm fine and sniffy about Coca-Cola, I can tell you. I don't drink Coca-Cola normally, but I have I never forget the taste of that ice cold Coca-Cola, followed by this delicious rice and mince. And then she took a pineapple and cut it into out of the cold box and cut it into chunks. And it was one of the most memorable meals I ever had in my life. And we had it there. Uh, sitting around a little on little timber stumps uh, uh, around a timber table in the jungle uh, beside the Azamasintha River, and uh, I would, you know, I I I don't know that I could ever recreate the flavour of that particular meal. Yeah, it was wonderful. Well, that's memory. the beauty, isn't it, of dishes and the memories, and 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 I want to just because um, I'm. I'm I knew that an hour with you, Darina, was never going to be. And I mean, I think we could sit here for three hours. Actually, I've still got so much to ask. I think we might have to do a part two, honestly. Um, <laughs> but anyway, let, let, let's 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 plow on and see how we go. The, the one thing I, I also wanted to ask you, you were very, very instrumental. Well, formative um, in creating the farmers markets. Oh, in Ireland. Yeah. And one of the other dishes you mentioned was smoked salmon and smoked mussels from the Middleton Farmers Market, which you have obviously been involved in. Do you want to tell us about that? Well, yes, I mean, if you ask me, not that I dwell on it much, if there's if any any little thing that I have done, been involved in that I you know, feel, I feel proud to have done, it's really to have re-established uh, and start, restarted the markets in Ireland, the farmers markets after a visit to actually to San Francisco when the farmers market in San Francisco was still in the parking lot actually. And that inspired me, it was like a light bulb going on because at that time uh, the local supermarkets were actually penalizing local shops for selling more than 2% local produce. So suddenly local people couldn't get local food any longer. Most people didn't even realize this was going on. And their local small farmers and everything who usually sold to the local shops could I no longer have somewhere to sell. It was really uh, a disaster. Anyway, so basically, uh, the in the I started the first, I came back and talked Merkel about it. She was all fired up and the two of us went in the following summer, uh, set up our stalls in the Cold Key in Cork where, uh, you know, proper shawlies had been, uh, there'd been a market for over 400 years. I was still on television at the time. And the shawlies couldn't believe, that. shawlies are named for the traders, lovely women who used to wrap themselves in shawls. And they couldn't believe their eyes when they saw me uh, with, uh, with the stall at the other side of the street with with uh, Frank Heatherman, uh, who smokes this one. Oh, smoked Frank... salmon is my favourite smoked yes. salmon in the whole. Yes. There yes. you are. Uh, so he was one of the original stall hosts. I mean, I can tell you it took a fine bit of courage to set up a stall on the side of the street at a time when in Ireland, you know, the whole attitude would be, you know, because of our history, people would think, my God, you'd want to be absolutely on your knees to sell from a stall on the side of the street. So it was such a, a contradiction in terms for many people to see us uh, in the, down there in the, the Cold Key in or the city and the Carolyn Robs, the various people who are still actually uh, uh, still in the farmers markets. Anyway, um, but I mentioned the uh, you already, of course, know Frank Heatherman's uh, uh, smoked salmon. He just bought mm. warm smoked salmon, cold smoked salmon, and it's superb. It's one of the wonderful flavors of Ireland wild salmon, as uh, smoked and uh, uh, and so that reminds me always of the 
the farmer's market love to bring a little home. And uh, oh, I, I, I just I remember the first time I had Frank's smoked salmon and, and I was, I, well, it's the finest as far as I'm concerned. It's like, well, for me, too, it's like, you know, um, the, the best the best black pudding comes from Ireland as far as I'm concerned. That's right. And Trishina, of course, Cork City. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm feeling rather guilty because we're, we're, we're almost running out of time and I did want to allow um, some some questions. Um, but I think maybe maybe people will forgive us because I can see from the comments that everybody's just enjoying listening to you. So may, maybe what we'll do is we'll, the part two will just be Q&A's from everybody as a as a result of this conversation. So, OK, I, I, I now want to to go to one of your final, which is an interesting um, uh, kind of not particularly maybe typically Irish you put globe artichokes as well tell me about globe artichokes Dorina well uh, of course absolutely this time of the year and I, I've never seen coming from a little tiny country village in Callahill and Cantonese what we had as I said a lovely kitchen garden but we didn't have artichokes and so when I came to Ballymaloo um, you know I came in in June at, at this time of the year I remember uh we had uh, globe artichokes for uh, dinner, well, for supper one evening. Now, one, the other one, the other revolutionary things about Myrtle was that all of us, our team, and she always talked about uh, who, all of us staff who worked with her. She never used to say for her. We all ate exactly the same food as the guests, which was very important for a whole lot of reasons. Not least, you know, uh, we would understand the food and and uh, how ener the energy to all the rest of it, and excitement about it. And I had no idea how to eat a. Uh, at, at Lobe Artichoke. My God, how, we all have to buy these things for the first time. Yeah. And I remember my lovely father-in-law, who was not my father-in-law at that time, saying to me, look, Doreena, you just watch me. Watch what I do. And he, you know, had a little bowl of melted butter with lemon juice in it. And he just pull off, start to the outside like this. Now pull off the leaves and dip it in there. And, you know, just uh, draw it across your teeth. And in that lovely, gentle way that he had, it took the fright out of it for me. Because, you know, Sometimes if you're in a situation like that, you can feel so out of your depth, but there was no way Ivan would make you feel out of your depth. So that reminds me of him, whom I loved so much too. And uh, my own children and grandchildren now absolutely love, at this time of the year, they love globe artichokes and the, you know, the thistle-like thing. And I don't know, for some reason, uh, little Jago seems to think they have something to do with dinosaurs, which is fine because anything to do with dinosaurs is happy with, really. Well, I said I said to you when we, we talked to the, about this before, it, it is really the perfect food for children, isn't it? Because they get to use their fingers and it is yeah. a flower. And it's just and I, and, I, and I remember saying to you that my daughter loved it. And, and I was the beneficiary because when she first started eating them, she never wanted to, she never wanted to eat the heart. So she'd have all the petals and then say, well, yeah. you can have the heart, mummy. And I went, thank you. This is fantastic. But then she yeah. wised up and she started getting in, into so the heart. She thought that was the boring bit, so she. <laughs> Can I very briefly ask you at the end? Because as I said, oh, Darina, I I could just go on talking to you for. Our, I mean, we could have just a. I mean, we we've only just scratched the surface. But, but well, tell me about your involvement with slow fun. food. What slow food was that born out of there? Because um, Carlo Petrini started when the seventies was it? Carlo started. Uh, uh, 19, yeah, no, 1986, I think it was, but, but I can't remember exactly, the 1980s anyway. Yeah, yes, so slow food, I kind of discovered it by accident, actually, because I was, um, I was awarded a Lange Sheretta Award. Uh, there, it's a winery in Italy uh, where they would give an award every year for a book that, uh, where, you know, t something to do with gastronomy or uh, preserving traditions, etc., etc. Anyway, and I, I really should have—I I can't remember when that was, but uh, at that stage we'd just got into the EU, and I was all fired up about. Uh, losing our, you know, the, I was so aware that so many of the small producers are being asked to comply with regulations that were totally out of the proportion to the risk involved and they were, and that the business couldn't afford it. Many of them are put out of business. It was a disaster, uh, you know, because the bureaucrats in Brussels had no conception or, or that they didn't in any way value traditional food production methods. Anyway, I was all fired up about this. And at that time, also, I got involved with the arson food forum with the food safety authority to battle on behalf of these people but uh, anyway off I go to Italy to collect this award and I had to give an acceptance speech and I did this through an interpreter 
And I was, so they, Italy, of course, was in the EU at that time. Ireland had joined. And I was sort of saying, Italy is such an amazing country. Every every part of Italy has a different tradition, this incredible rivalry between all the different uh, counties, so to speak, or provinces. And I, I said, you must, you know, we've just got into the EU now. You, mu you know, you mustn't lose your food culture. You mustn't you know, use your butchers, your bakers, all the amazing things that are so unique to every single part of Italy. And on and on I went all fired up. This was done to an interpreter. And at the end, I just got this, the room just rose up and I got this standing ovation and this clap. And this man came running over to me. Now it wasn't Carlo, it was a, a, one of the top people in a Slow Food. And he said, have you heard of slow food? And I said, no. And he said, well, you've just given their manifesto in your speech. He said, <laughs> he said you must start slow food in Ireland. And uh, so uh, he told me all about it. And when I came back, my husband said, if you start one more thing, I'm out of here. <laughs> That's it. You're doing it. That was so my lovely friend, Jana Ferguson from Gubbin Cheese, actually, she was the person who started uh, the the uh, slow food, and then we were all founder members with her. But it's been, in, uh, you know, in a way, uh, slow food was kind of it's it's sort of the way we are. If you know what I mean, it's not. It was never a conversion on the road to Damascus. It was just the way we lived our lives, and it fit, fitted in with our philosophy and our, you know, our way of farming, our way of growing, our way of eating, and uh, and our way of supporting local and small producers, which was something, of course, that Myrtle did also totally from the beginning. Uh, you know, she built up a whole network of art as small producers, farmers and fishermen and butchers and everything to supply value. At a time when I can tell you, most people had no, as we say in Ireland, mass on local food or even respect for mm. it. In fact, we had an incredible, ridiculous inferiority complex. We thought that what you had in the UK or what was in America had to be more sophisticated than what we had. Mm. But Myrtle knew the value and she knew how good our basic Irish produce was. Anyway, I've been involved with slow food ever since. It's been kind of in limbo for the last year and a half, but, uh, and also there's a very strong educational element always to slow food. So in our East Cork uh, Slow Food Convivio, we link it with nine local schools and each of those schools must have a school garden and teach the children how to sow seeds and grow and they have a little compost heap. And I send uh, a little chicken coop and two hens to each of the schools so the children can learn how to keep chickens and, and look after them. And then the manure goes to the compost so they grow more, the soil is more fertile for them to grow more vegetables. And everything. Very so, much in, in, in the tradition of, of, of Alice Waters, who I know you know and has done um, great things with, with um, um, well, underprivileged and, and, and actually giving children this wonderful sense of, of achievement by growing something. Yeah. And, and I've seen it too on young children who learn to grow or learn to cook. And, and it is the most yes. wondrous thing, isn't it? Yeah. And then they'll eat everything. If they grow something, they'll eat everything. So they come up to the school, then we teach them how to cook, of course. And they go all around the farm and they find out about earthworms. So, and if I can do. I hope that before I pop my socks or hang up my apron eventually and go up and, and cook for himself up there, uh, basically that I and there are many, many others of us who feel just as strongly that we can see cooking, growing and cooking re-embedded in our national curriculums. I mean, what are we like letting generations of children out of our houses and our schools without the basic skills to feed themselves properly, paying right into the hands of the multinational food companies. And so that people are helpless, the more de-skilled we are. Uh, the, the, anyway, so let's all pick up a pen, write to our ring the, you know, write to our MEPs or our TDs or whatever. I don't know, I've been, and many, many other people in Ireland and in your country and in America as well are all, there are lots of great initiatives, but it has to be a national initiative. Yeah. What I was just going, as I said, we, there are, I've got at least half a dozen more topics, but maybe we can just very quickly, because one of the questions I was going to ask you, because I know very little about what's happening on the school curriculum in Ireland. I mean, obviously, we've had battles galore here in the UK and getting cooking back on rather than food tech, which is, you know, designing a package for a pizza rather than hands on. What, what, what's happening in Ireland very briefly at the moment, Darina, on the school curriculum with, with food and cookery? Well, basically, there's some schools have what they call social and scientific. I mean, you know, it's 
uh, in the end, it's far more important to teach somebody how to flip and cook than how a microwave works. Yeah, you know, sure. no blinking what? I have no idea what's going on in the saucepan when I'm cooking, but mm. uh, as not, but I do know how to get it to taste good and all the rest of it. So basically, the progress has been made. I think the penny is slowly dropping, but we're not there yet. I mean, trying to change a curriculum is trying to turn a liner around. I remember a number of years ago, I was told by somebody at the top of the Department of Education uh, who writes a curriculum, it would take five years to change the curriculum. They're still saying that margarine is better than butter and <laughs> low fat is better than butter. I mean, that you, my grandchildren have to give the wrong answer in their exams to get full marks. Still. And we've highlighted this and it's an, well, you know, you can imagine it's a disgrace. Uh, I mean, if there was only, don't listen to me, don't listen to anybody, just look at the research that low fat thing was the biggest con of the 20th and 21st century and properly harmful to people's health. Uh, anyway, look there, don't get me started. I uh, know. <laughs> I mean, Darina, Darina, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact, as I said, we, we could, that the comments have been, um, you know, I decided, I, I took an executive decision just to carry on chatting because I thought we probably would cover some of the things that, uh, that people wanted to, uh, to, to ask questions about. But I feel that we've, we, as I said, we, we've only just scratched the surface because we, we, we really haven't had the chance to. I wanted to talk to you about the festival you started and whether that's likely to come back again because obviously that was groundbreaking you put you put literature and food but maybe we should maybe I think we need to put this on the back burner uh, suitably on the back burner to keep some because I can absolutely tell that by the comments we've got we've got the potential for at least another hour's chat with you so what I'm going to do now is um with great reluctance because this has been utterly fabulous um is to hand back to fiona and let her wind up Dorina, thank you so much you want I to say to, i have to tell you about my luxury for my desert island oh yeah no sorry your luxury <laughs> tell us what your um, luxury is. if i'm allowed one luxury and i want a hen okay yes. a hen because the hen will lay eggs for me and they're great company actually I could chat to my hen and so that's my luxury if you'll allow me that on my desert island and, and, and do you think you might you might find an indigenous cock on the island or cockerel on the island that you might you might breed another another oh, <laughs> very species <laughs> well I'll, I'll keep my eyes open for that okay <laughs> Oh, God, I can't believe I almost forgot your luxury, Dorina. Thank you. A, a, a hen, which is absolutely sensational. Fiona, I'm, I'm going to stop there and hand over to you. Otherwise, we're going to go on until about 10 o'clock. Oh, this oh, is thanks. so hard to end. It's, uh, it, it really, really is. And I think, um, as you can tell from the chat, that everybody would like a part two and then a part three. And goodness knows how many parts after that. You're just such a delight, Darina, and uh, I hope you realise uh, how loved you are around the world. Um, thank you, everyone, for spending uh, this time with us. Um, to be continued, this is absolutely not the end. Uh, please do follow us on social media and keep up to date with what we're doing. I would love to see more of you uh, to, be, to join our, our network and, and help other women. But thank you so much, Darina. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Adele from Sustainable Food Trust. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. And uh, yeah, this has been really special. So very heartwarming. Thank you very much. Good, Good night.